Victor, fantastic to be here. Nice to have you in person at Sway Tech. Uh, thank you. We're lucky to have Ricky with us today. You've got a very interesting career. I've been doing a little bit of reading up on you. Mechatronics, a mechatronics engineer. Hadn't actually heard of that before until did a little bit of digging. Um, bit of a specialist in obviously engineering, but also bringing IoT into this world of um, data. Your LinkedIn profile talks about over a thousand industry events, lots of bad coffee. Right? <laughs> Plus you've done some podcasting yeah. before, you know, yes. the Revenue Reveal podcast. So um, awesome to have you here. And you've got some exciting news that's happened this week. So why don't you just tell us the story of what kind of brought you here and, and maybe you can share Jeez. your... You make me sound good. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's what swaying with yeah, strangers yeah. and friends yeah. is all about. I'll keep it a bridge. So obviously as a kid, uh, I was into making things and breaking things and fixing things because I could never get it right the first time. Uh, so naturally led me to engineering. Mechatronics was just coming up then my full so I didn't quite know what it was but I, it seemed to gravitate me because it was engineering, it was robotics, it was, you know, as the name would suggest, mechanical computers, yeah. electronics, right? All thrown into one, one basket. Again, I started my engineering degree at Auckland Uni. I found that to be quite academic, theory-based, so I switched to Massey Uni, where it was much, much more practical. So I enjoyed that, right? So and then you kind of fast forward, I, I did that. I came out thinking, what am I going to do? I jumped into a consulting engineering role. Yeah. Lots of design, lots of learning. But again, I found that within my first year, it wasn't me. I just didn't think it was me sitting behind the desk designing stuff. So I switched to a company called Schneider Electric. Yeah, uh, who we all know. Who we all know, big, big beast, right? Great company, lots of good mentors. Uh, started off doing some big projects, hospitals. So think of hospitals, data centers, prisons, yeah, okay. uh, shopping centers. So all those kind of started on site. Uh, did engineering in terms of like the actual putting components together. Made my way into, someone thought it would be a good thing to Push this guy into management, so did most of that. So stayed there for about ten years. Lots of different roles, played around with a lot of digital tools, lots yeah. of technology. So you can kind of start to see like how it's all coming together, and that's when I ran into a company called Simpro mm. because we needed a tool for our full service business. So that's how I got to know Simpro. Fast forward a few years, I ended up working with Simpro and became their first ever CRO. Um, so that's kind of in, in a nutshell. Yep. And then off late, so once we jumped out of Simpro, me, my mate Sean, who's the CEO and the founders at Simpro, we started our own little venture capital fund, Venture on Partners. Venture on Partners, yep. Through that, we made some key investments, one being Deep Space, that's into construction tech. And as of just with this week, as you said, I've just stepped into the hot seat of CEO for that role, yeah, which is quite brilliant. exciting. Congratulations. Um, thank you. So, Super pumped about that, and we can perhaps come back to it. But that's kind of been the journey of the last, you know, 20 years in a, in a yeah. compressed way. And I love, you have obviously have an affiliation with data, IoT, Deep Space is built with data. A lot of your content is around data. So data is obviously, you know, if you think about the engineering piece, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a theme for you. Tell, tell me what that, is that fascination with data and how you've seen that kind of come to life? It's awesome, right? We're going to get into the GTM too. So it's all about data. But when you think about data, so on a large side, think of an airport, right? Going back 20 years, it was all about, we don't know what we're capturing. We don't quite know what we're building. So there was a disconnect in design through the construction phase, yep. right? And obviously as the BIM engineering has come in, we, there's lots of more modeling going in, digital twins and all of that good stuff's happening. But what's happening on a large construction site, Michael, is there's so much data coming at you like like yeah, anything, like, any, yeah, like yeah, anything. Yeah. To give you an example, one of the uh, projects that Deep Space team has been working on, it's already up to eight trillion, eight trillion data points. Yeah. So we're talking some mega points, right? In terms of like how much data it's capturing, it's an aggregator that just takes in from all different sources. Now, what do you do with data? Like, what? This is the this key. is the yeah. key. So Deep Space is this analytic intelligence platform, which drives insights embedded with AI technology. So it tells you, Michael, this is what you go need to go do based on the data it's reading. So it's forecasting as well as looking at this. Yeah, right. trend. So it's, it's really kind of, it's latest tech on built on and solving problems that have forever existed. And problems industry. that clearly you understand 
and have given your experience from Schneider all the way through, like this is this is your world. So data and yeah. being able to build, you know, deep tech around that's great, but you've got to know what data is important and how to organize it. It's a, it's a good thing you bring up. I think it's a, it's an organic thing that's naturally happened here, but domain experience is key, right? I, yeah. I think if you look back at my experience, a lot of people I respect, I think you need to know the subject, Yep. right? Yeah, so. so. It's, it's no different than Simpro, we were dealing with trades and constructions, Schneider, we were dealing with construction and trades, so again, everything is kind of, everything I've done, or including my degree, has always been around this, right? Yeah. So it's almost like a full 360 in some sense, right? Um, so look, so that, good. and I think that, you know, one of the things, so we, there's a lot of talk around go to market, and obviously for all the other Kiwi tech companies, whether they're SaaS, or not is how do you grow outside of New Zealand and therefore you need to have some sort of go-to-market motion and you've had huge success with Simpro and obviously helping with um, you know Venture On and now Deep Space. So what are, you've, you've had some successes, I'm sure you've had some missteps yeah. along the way. What Lots. are what are some of those kind of <coughs> insights that you can share around how to get go-to, where to start and how to get go-to-market right? Such a good question and broad question too, right? Um, a lot of it just comes back to who your customer is. Knowing your yeah. ICP, starting with your ICP, again, the next step is personas. Yes. For me, it's like, who is the buyer? Yeah. Who's the user? And then who are the customers you're targeting? I think once you get that piece right, a lot of it becomes easier. Again, there's lots of different flavors, right? So there's PLG motion, yes. there's, there's sales-led motion, partner-led, yep. community-led. So with everything I've done predominantly, it's kind of been in the SME, mid-market space. Yep. Deep space obviously is in the enterprise, so was Schneider, but not being a technology company. So what works for the one company doesn't necessarily work for the That's other. However, the pitfalls or the, you know, the bear traps are quite common, yep. which, you know, obviously you're rushing to the market, yep. not having a good product or having a good product, but not having a, Go to market strategy that's in sync with the product. Yeah, right? That often happens. Um, I like to use this common or very really simple analogy of crawl, walk, and run. Right? Crawl, walk, walk and, and run. run. Right? So, or to put it in other words, observe, test, oh, sorry, observe, try, right? And then iterate. You, you can't just go doing all things at once. So in, I think we struggle with that in New Zealand because we often the journey is master New Zealand, become your domain experts in the area of the, the, the problem the tech solves. You do very well, then you start going to another country and, and you've got to make some decisions as to which go to market and which countries. Mm. So let's say you've decided that. How do you test? So you know, very few companies have a large enough war chest unless they've raised to be sure. able to go full into the new market. They've got to keep the home market working. So in your experience in that, you know, crawl, walk, how do you test where you start crawling? And do you, do you talk about crawling in a couple of markets at the same time and then seeing where you can walk and then focusing there? Or yeah, yeah. how do you, what's your advice? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, this is something we're going through at Deep Space right now. So I can perhaps talk a little yeah. more about specifics. I like to think follow green shoots, right? Yep. So I'm a big believer or a fan of owning your home market, to a certain degree, right? You need to have that confidence. The reason I say that, when you do decide to go overseas, you need to have the home market ticking, yeah, the, the right. cash cow, yes, right? Yep. The engine needs to ru keep running. So therefore, own it, get to a point where it's now founder-led, right? It's got some sort of repeatability, pre predict predictability into, yep. into a business, and then it's a case of, if you build a good enough business, if you raise enough interest, you most likely are going to get some sort of interest from the market, whether it be Australia, your next step, UK, Middle East, Middle North East. America, yeah. right? All over the place. The, at deep space, given our founders profile, given the problems we're solving, given the connection between the tier one enterprise customers, they naturally are taking us to other areas yeah, of the right. world, right? It's not something we have proactively driven. When you work on an airport in Australia, which is obviously a very high compliance and building levels, right? Someone in Hong Kong's gonna pay attention. 
So we got dragged into Hong Kong. Now, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, all these places, they've got more cranes than we yeah. can count. So does North America when you look at Toronto. So all these things like these green shoots, so then you start, for me, going back to this core cool walk and run, you start to go, what does this look like? Now, do we go set up an entity and hire people? Do we go to a reseller model? Do we go to a referral model? That's kind of the next stage, mm. which is the walk path, right? Yep. So that's where you got to go, does it make sense for me to defocus from home market? As the founder. As a founder. Yes. Right? And then go into another region, whether I'm going to relocate, I'm going to hire someone, do I set up this entity, engage lawyers, there's, you know, these professional services, or do I just keep doing things here? Or do I now establish a team yeah. in where I can split duties? Right? So at Deep Space, Luke, who's one of the founders, was in a CEO seat. An amazing, wonderful founder, a deep domain expert, a person who's very self-aware has gone, this is, there's a lot going on here. Yeah. It's not perhaps everything I want to do. It's not where I think my skills lie. Yeah. It's also perhaps things I don't enjoy. It doesn't fill my cup. So this is an organic transition. Tra uh, Transition, transition that's taking yeah. place, right, in a business. So that's something you need to be mindful of. Again, there is no one-size-fits-all approach, but that's what's working for us here. And I think that yeah. observ I think the a founder being honest about what lights his fire, what he's good at, and therefore where does growth come from? Is it, a, you know, do you bring in that new team in a new market? But this question of the new market, so, you know, the, we're seeing clients at the moment you know, Kiwi tech companies playing in the US <coughs> going, it's too hard, not enough war chests, let's go to Australia at the moment. How, how do you select? You got, you've had some huge success with Simpro into the US. Yeah. Well, talk to me through like market selection. How did you choose the US? You've got um, Deep Space, you talked about the UK, you know, UAE, um, and then North America. Huge mm. choices, mm. each has mm. its own implications. Mm. Where do you start? How do you start to assess that? A uh, really good question. Uh, again, I think for us, it's really just a couple of key people creating this little investment or a selection committee, yeah. right? Who are looking at the size of the market, just, to, uh, just high level thesis. Size of the market, can we attack the market? For me, it's not just about Tam and Sam and all the things we talk about. Who are the actual customers? Yeah. What would it be like? So I call it there's a lot of talk about account-based marketing. I call it account-based selling in, our, in, in, in this business. Yep. What would it look like for me to get to Michael if he is my you know, customer that yep. I wish to target? Can I get to him? What would, you know, what would the actual steps to get to Michael? What is the length, the sales cycle? So therefore, I think looking at those kind of key metrics for us to go, okay, it makes sense to go to the US for this, this, this reason because we can attack it yeah, right. and I think we can get success. It's backing yourself too that you're game ready. And because you started with the ICP and the persona, you now know who Michael is. So it's about finding out how many Michaels are there in the market that's that it. we want. That's it. Um, and that's a very, I think that's a very important point. We see a lot of companies almost forget that, especially as they get to three, four, five years old, that the ICP may be different or the challenges that the ICP is facing could be different yeah, in the market yeah, yeah. at the time. I've seen this often, especially with venture on the amount of pitch decks, right? Where a lot of founders fall in the trap of talking about Tam and Sam yeah. and Som. All good stuff. Again, no one size fit all approach. But to me it's also about how you're going to get to them. What would that look like? Talk about talent. Talk about talent recruitment. Yeah, okay. You know, it's really the practical steps. The investment thesis at a high level is amazing. To that gives you some sort of a direction on a compass to go. I'm better off entering yeah. Canada as opposed to the U.S. because of Commonwealth. There is some familiarity and all that sort of stuff, right? There's a number of things that you have to address. But for me, it's just like, where am I going to get revenue very quickly? What would this look like? And as the founder or the driver of entering a new market, how do you keep attention and focus on the home market? Because at that point, that's where the cash flow is coming from, unless you've raised. Mm -hmm. So how do you allocate your time? How do you manage that? Or how do you orient, orientate your leadership team 
to focus from current to new market entry? Mm. Uh, great question. So again, perhaps I can lean back on Simpro experience and what's happening with Deep Space. Simpro was, in terms of maturity, was a late stage startup yeah. when we started to go, okay, we're going to have a decentralized leadership team, right? So therefore, our home market, ANZ, was pretty secure in the sense you had right. good sales leaders and yeah. marketing leaders, go-to-market leaders, they could own the space without, really, without needing too much of oversight. So therefore, for me and the rest of the exec team, our focus had shifted by then to Northern Hemisphere, right? So yeah. then it was a case of split. Right. Okay, I'm gonna split my focus 50% on the US, 30% UK, 20% ANZ, because I've got to establish leadership so I think team. That's the key there. You've got a team already in place managing with processes and the sales and marketing and product and customer success rigor mm. to maintain and grow your home market. What if your earlier stage, what would advice would you give yeah. to a founder who is earlier stage and seeing good product market fit in the home market? but not enough growth because the market is not big enough, mm. therefore looking to, and has decided on another market. What's the bet? How does that shift then, right? Because, you know, fast forward three years, it might be that the bulk of the revenue yeah, yeah. will be coming yeah, yeah. from sure. the new market. Yeah. So I have a slightly controversial take perhaps on this. I just don't think you can hack your way to growth. So if you're struggling in your home market, I don't think scaling to another market mm. or going into another market is going to solve this issue, right? You, you've got to somehow find a way, whether moving into adjacent industry, looking at you know, building your ICP, whatever it may be. We didn't, at Simpro, we didn't enter US and UK just because our ANZ market wasn't performing. It was performing really well. Right, that's really so important. So that was important. And then same in Deep Space. Like Deep Space has already got really good runs on the board for Australian market. Like that's, that's its home ground, it'll always be its home ground. And it's been the customers and the prospects are dragging us into other regions, yeah, okay. right? This will always be, for the near future, the focus. Yeah. So now, the second part to your question, how do you do it if you are starting to see some green shoots? Then it's about really quickly, Michael, just establishing the team. Yeah. Right? So people. for us, hence why people, 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 big, obviously big, um, big on that piece. And that's why Luke and I teaming up, right? So we are going, okay, Luke, this is what you're really good at. Let's go focus on this. Give me all this administration task that's sitting on your desk here. Yeah. And I'll take some of the load off, so therefore you can help us go there faster. Right, speed. Speed's the other thing, Michael. We haven't yeah. touched on. Right, speed's the key. So it really is. You know, in the SaaS world, is it you know red blood ocean? Is it like where are you going? Is it highly competitive? Have you, you know, are you a category leader? Are you defining a new category? I co often think, um, someone said this to me on our podcast. Apple wasn't the first smartphone producer, right? Zero wasn't the first accounting platform on this planet. Nothing that you ever see is not naturally not necessarily the best product or the first. It's just can you market it well enough? So that this is where the whole go to market and product synergy comes in. Well and this is where the positioning and the storytelling and the marketing mm -hmm. which gets you to open the door. I think that leads like you know, so the go to market piece is a, is a is the 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 place where your strategy and decisions and choices start. Now you're in market. Now you've you know you're talking about marketing and growth. There's this idea of the customer journey and the buying journey. And I think often we get confused, and I'm going to use the royal we in terms of sure, organisations sure. because the customer journey we talk about that and it makes sense. But actually, when you think about the two, the customer versus the buyer journey is quite different. So talk to me about your experience, and especially know that you've had a lot of success thinking and understanding deeply about that buyer experience mm -hmm. piece. Yeah, I love it for a number of reasons, right? Uh, again, I think obviously it's, it's, it's like two siblings. They go hand in hand, but they're very different in terms of their stages. So buyer's journey for me is all about brand awareness, positioning, messaging, attracting prospects into your funnel. 
customer journey is being obsessed with your customers and taking them taking them down this route where you're going to get obviously eventually referrals yes cross sell and upsell and all the good stuff right advocates advocates evangelists yeah and yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. raving fans and all that yeah. but the the one thing i'm a big fan of when you're mapping out this like buyer's journey and customer journey is working out their emotional barometer like where they're going to be so we went through this exercise at Simpro, and it became really evident that there was a level of excitement when they first signed up, like super high. Yeah. So smiley faces, like big grin. Two, three months later, they were obviously not, not so, uh, you know. Uh, the shine has rubbed <laughs> off a little bit. They weren't smiling as much, right? So it hasn't solved all their problems because nothing ever exactly. can. There's no silver bullet. Exactly. So having to then put in the work of onboarding, implementing such a solution, which then required a lot of business changes, Michael, that was something that they had to address. So it typically just went through a bit of a sine wave. It wasn't it up until about six to 12 months where you found them back again at right. that smiley face uh, level? So typically, would it be fair to say, focusing on the buyer journey, get them in the funnel, get them to close the deal, stop, move on, and I want to come back, you said raving fans. So yeah. to create the raving fans, you've got to think about what it's like to be a customer. And that's that, you know, you the excitement of being onboarded and, and the potential of the solution, mm. the reality never matches that. So what's your one yeah. kind of piece of advice, I guess, as you, as companies, you know, acquire new customers, job done, move on to the next one, but mm. actually you want to hold on to the ones you have because it's a lot cheaper to love and grow the ones you do than acquire sure, new customers. Sure. How do you make sure you continue to focus on that? Ooh, if there's that one thing, I look at maybe two. Yeah, yeah. For, I mean, for for me, everything again because everything I've done has been in B two B SaaS verticals, right? So these people don't necessarily get up every morning thinking I'm going to go buy a new digital tool. They're not also no. being marketed so heavily like we are. So for them, when they do buy a piece of software, it's a massive shift and a massive change. So you've got to be in their shoe to go, what does this mean? What does it mean for my business? So being really obsessive with their challenges, right? And then overcoming those challenges. And then obviously being empathetic because as I said, on that emotional yeah. curve, they do put a lot of faith in that this is going to change my life. But for the first three, six months, it's a bit of a horror story. But so for them to go through that, you're just going to stick with them. So having dedicated teams, having teams that are focused. So our customer journey was actually quite comprehensive. You know, there was a lot of handshakes. Right. So it went from implementation consultant to account management back to someone who was then cross-selling and upselling at this right time. There was admin, there was support. So you had a lot of care factor. Right. So how person. did you get the insights to understand mm. those different stages? That's a roller coaster, right? As you as they work through using your product and there's always a drop in productivity. Whenever you move mm. to a new tool, there's always some sort of regression, bef you know, you've got to go backwards to go forwards. So how did you begin to map and understand that and then build those different roles you just talked about mm. to support that customer journey? Look, a few, few different ways. So I'm going to go back to data play here for a yeah. minute, as well as being a customer. So obviously I was a customer. So having been at the receiving end, what that felt like useful. Gave, me, gave me some additional ins insights. But then looking at the product usage, you just highlighted that no customer ever peaks and stays there, right, in terms of product usage. So we learned some data and we quickly worked through that, you know, after the initial hype, there was a drop off. And then once they got through that, the pickup, the usage would pick up again and there'd be a bunch of support tickets and once we got past those so mapping that out interviewing and sitting down with a whole lot of customers i i just i think you mentioned thousand trade shows and all the things i've done i've been a big fan of just doing this with our customers i've spent more time with our customers and prospects on trade stands for a reason instead of behind the desk mm. goes back to my early days of being a design engineer versus a site engineer I think there, nothing beats that face-to-face to, -face to yeah, go, got it. what is it that you just tell me and being in the business. And I think that's why we had this customer journey that was so beautifully mapped out. We had salespeople who would often go to customers to sit down and work through the challenges, implementation consultant who would actually go out and be on site 
spend four or five days with them, have coffees, dinners, be in the kitchen and go, okay, this is what it feels like. It's chaotic. And now I'm asking you to do things. You're a small business. I'm asking you to move, like, turn your phone off for two hours. That's not, sometimes that's not, mm. it's not going to happen, right? So I think knowing all of that, Michael, just gave us these deep insights. And therefore, we quickly realized that things had to be done in phases. We had to be quite, I guess, you know, mindful of what the, what we were doing to these businesses and just be in sync with them as opposed to just pushing down a solution yeah, right. down their throat. So it wasn't about that. And I think, I'm just going to come back to this, yeah. spending time with a customer. I think that in every business, once you've got into a rigor and emotion, you can forget. And the senior leadership team mustn't forget to be back in front of and walk a day in the shoes of their customer because mm. I think... What we're seeing now with the proliferation of new sort of tech tools and data-driven insights and obviously AI, Gen AI, is that the way your customer uses your product may be changing based on what's going on in the market or the way the problems are solved is changing. So you don't know that unless there is some way, mechanism, some sort of customer feedback loop. Oh, huge, huge. I mean, it's again, a lot of people are not a big fan of jumping on a plane getting in their car, but I just don't think anything will come close to spending time with your customers. Yeah. So I think we live in a world, I even wrote a LinkedIn post this morning about being a remote first company as a t in, in a tech business gives is an advantage, but that doesn't mean we don't spend any time with our customers. Yeah. I'd happily jump on a plane tomorrow if I had to, to go spend time with yeah. customers. Nothing will ever beat that. Now, as you get larger, you be, you know, PE backed and, you know, the amount of, uh, I guess, as an exec, the pressure and the reporting and the things you have to do, you can't spend as much time as you would like to. However, we as a, an exec team were quite mindful of that. So we always said, like, spend at least 20%. Right, which uh, interesting. You know, is a, is a loose kind of expectation, but spend enough time with the customers and customers first. So family, obviously, high up on the <laughs> high up on the list. First. Yes, but from Sometimes. a yeah, 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 from a business perspective, like customers first. Yeah. So if it meant that internal meeting had to be shifted or cancelled, yeah, because that's of, important. It's hugely important. I often see a lot of people doing things the other way around. Yeah. How does so for a New Zealand Kiwi Tech, you know, for Kiwi Tech to to grow, there's a scale moment. Sure. Some of what you've talked about in terms of how you put customer first and even thinking about how you get those insights doesn't scale. How, so it, it begins to lead us to the data, the data insights, which is that is an, obviously an important way to scale because you can start to get insights through data and then go talk to customers in a way of validating and checking rather than hopping on a plane and meeting every single customer. Sure. So, yeah. And obviously, you're a bit of a data guy, um, but talk to me about your experience and the role of data in scaling. And I'm going to preface this with a lot of the clients that we talk with at the moment are at this point where the data's not well organized. It's sitting in a CRM and on the salesperson's spreadsheets and in heads and in an Asana board. But we now know that you know to be able to use AI, et cetera, it's a data play. And so as companies start to look offshore, it's about bringing a you know, single view of the customer and all the different data sorts to allow that customer journey or buyer journey to be really honed. So how does that data play? And where do you start? It's a big Jeez, question. <laughs> so there's a lot in there. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's a great question. It's like, where do you even begin when That's, there's so much coming at you, right? I think so... I'm going to try and answer it in a few different ways. I mean, f the big advantage of being a New Zealand-based company is that you can get a lot of good data points to begin with because we, we're we easy to connect, right? Like there's a two or three degrees of separation. Yeah, so we okay. can get to people pretty quickly. So try and collect that data, get it into a some sort of a framework. CRM is a tool, but try and understand what does that mean in terms of what is their buyer's journey. What does that customer journey look like? Try and map the key data points into right. your CRM, into your tools, where you can look back and go, this is my sales cycle. This is what my typical ACV looks like. This is kind of loosely my funnel. This is where, these are the channels that work. What we're not good at necessarily here in ANZ, I call it Australia and New Zealand, 
is that sales doesn't come naturally to us, mm. right? So it's not something we do. So therefore, when we do do it, it's kind of, it's done because we have, and then there's not really much science behind that, right? So I'm a big fan of reverse waterfall. So reverse waterfall is basically, for those who don't quite understand, is like, how many prospects do I need to speak to before I get a paying customer? That's a, that's a problem we're all going to have to solve if you're in a tech business yep. at some point. Now, it doesn't mean I have to go talk to 50 prospects to try and get two customers. And that's okay. It just means that at some point, I'm going to then have to go to bigger markets, yep. right? Like, I think these are all the things that you must not. Like, at some point, as soon as you either get to, like, 300k ARR, you need to try and map it out in some shape or form. What does the success look like for my business? Yeah, okay. The business modeling, pricing strategy, there's so much to it. I often say product is hard to develop. There's no doubt, right? Like zero doubt. You have to have a good product. Yeah. That's your moat. Yeah. But go to market and figuring that out, owning it, scaling it is going to take you 10 times longer. Yeah, right. In my experience, I'm not saying that's no. the only way, but it does take that much longer. So just, again, the reason I say this, you've got to just be... You gotta be patient. I think often you also fall in the trap of trying too many things, trying too many different channels. So you talked a lot about speed, and now you've just said patience, yeah. right? <laughs> I think this yeah, is the challenge. Yeah. So we have to, you know, you, there's no point having the greatest product and getting it to, you know, 90% of its awesomeness, mm -hmm. and sometimes it is about test and iterate. But there is this view of being realistic and patient. How do you what's that? How do you find that that you know we as a leader yeah, now yeah. CEO when do you push? Yeah, and when do you go? We need patience here. And for you personally, where is where does that patience piece? Where do you struggle with that? I I want to be faster here, but I know now that patience is what's needed. It's a great question. I, I that this is the balance, I guess, in terms of growth. When do you push on the accelerator? When you back off, right? So speed is one of those superpowers that I feel like I have, right? In terms of making decisions very quickly, you know, type of a thing on a tactical basis. Yep. When you bring it up a layer, it's very important to recognize, to go, what is my rally cry? I call it, are we going to go to the US? Are my data points there? Therefore, if I'm committed, then we're doing it, yeah. right? We're doing it and we're doing it with focus and a narrow focus. Now, anything that does not fit in that wedge is going to be a no. Right, okay. Doesn't matter how good the opportunity okay. is, for the time being, it's a no. It's never, like it's not a forever no, it's not a no for this quarter, or at least next six months. Now, there are financial complications like any business, what's my burn rate? Do I have funding? Am I looking for funding? So there's all of those different elements that come to play, Michael. But I'm just thinking of a business that's got some money in the bank. It's yep. got some good user base, right? It's, it's, it's doing its thing. So that's when I think this focus comes in. So for me, I can easily now go, go to bed knowing that our focus and our team is like deeply focused here. If there's an opportunity that comes tomorrow and we're okay to walk past it and go no, no problem. So the trap that I see a lot of businesses fall under and which then falls into a lifestyle business category is when you start chasing revenue. Because if the revenue is coming from Australia, if it's coming from UK, it's from home market, North America, all of a sudden you become defocused because you're chasing four opportunities too many. as opposed to too many, right? So I think a lot of it just goes back to what are we going to do as a team and stick to it? Yeah. This idea of scale. So obviously, you know, New Zealand companies will have to scale at some point. There's a lot of talk about don't build your business to scale at the beginning because if you don't survive, scale's irrelevant. So you've got to master, often inside, you know, not necessarily SaaS, but you actually need to overinvest in customer success and selling to understand what works and what doesn't and really wrap your self around the customer and then you get to a moment where okay now we've got these growth moments and so now you've got a scale discussion in your experience how do you know when and how to scale so when is that moment where you're like okay now i've got to start looking at my cost of sale and cost of acquisition and my customer success right because they're not scalable 
and now I've got to look at tools at automation. Mm -hmm. When is that moment in your experience? Uh, the aha moment for me comes when there's predictability. For me, like being... Predictability, yeah. right. For me, as a person of some sort of an engineering background, if I'm in a position to go, what would the next month and quarter look like, and I can get to it, I know the business is in a good shape. So therefore, that allows me, it gives me confidence yeah, okay. to now take it to the next stage. Yeah. If I'm guessing as to where we're gonna end up at this month, next quarter, and it's lumpy, I often think there are issues we need to resolve before we start talking about scaling. Because I often go, go, going back to my early comment, scaling shouldn't be an answer to your problems. Like yeah. if, if you've got problems that you need to solve, to your point, Michael, if it's about customer success, onboarding, making sure like all of that stuff is actually buttoned up, you're not quite ready for scaling. Even though if you're getting those, mm. uh, that's, you know, again, coming back to my experience, yes. even if you're getting those opportunities, sometimes it's, it's just okay to say, not for now, because we need to sort this out. So how does the, how does, so there's gotta be an anchor. So, you know, you just talked about, you know, you've got to make sure that your, your home market is strong, but also the way you're servicing your customers. If you try to go to a new market, that will mm. exacerbate those problems. Yeah. Therefore, the scale becomes a challenge. Mm. What's the importance of having a vision and a goal in that decision-making process? And how has that helped you having a clear vision for your organization of, the, you know, what it, the purpose, the vision, the goal of why you're here and the problems you solve? Oh. <laughs> Pulling out yeah. the big guns today. Yeah, yeah, you're putting all the deep. Uh, oh, huge, because that's kind of that's that's your compass and everything yeah. you're doing as a business, right? If you don't know what you're going, where you're going, and what you're going for, you're going to be lost. So I think having a unified vision, and then I think distilling it down. So I think vision and mission and values. It's another one we could even have a, another episode about. It's all great, but if people don't know it at the you know where it matters it's irrelevant mm -hmm. so therefore having really coming back to the point of being really transparent as a business as a leadership team and then walking everyone through as to what you're doing today matters because this is where we're heading right so i think going back to, again i go back to little frameworks so rally cry yeah focus for this quarter own home like for us at d space at the moment it's like we're going to end this year really well by focusing on the home market, yep. right? We are looking at a number of other things and that's happening on the side, it's peripheral vision, but this is where the focus is. That's now broken down into chunks of projects and then tasks, and everyone kind of knows where they're heading. Yeah, okay. it's, it's clear, and I know when you then start to go, oh no, no, no actually, we're now moving here because there's a big opportunity that's coming. That creates a lot of headwind in a business. Right. So you've got to be mindful of headwind and tailwind. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I've quite answered I think what well, I think, you know, the, the vision and mission has to stay front and centre. The monthly, quarterly, year-end goals can shift, but why mm -hmm. you're there mm -hmm. and the purpose of the organisation and the vision you have long-term doesn't. The steps, the path can zag and zig wherever. Sure. Yeah. And I think what you're also saying is don't you don't want to zig and zag too much because there's a massive amount of energy required and confusion if suddenly everything's changing from quarter to quarter. It's a, just a huge disruption, right? When yeah. you think about it, like just being in a seat where you're being told one thing one day and it shifts the other. I think coming back to your original question about being a vision, it's, it's, you've got to have something that's powerful that extends beyond you. So at Simpro, it was obviously we wanted to make change the way tradies give their life back, basically. At Deep Space, it's very clear that these data is becoming quite an issue for a lot of people. People are pulling their hair, there's time issues, there's rework, there's lots of inefficiencies and people are losing money and these are large organisations that have to report their numbers on stock exchange. So it has this massive impact on community and society as a whole. Yeah, right. If a hospital is delayed by two years, society feels that impact mm. too, right? So for us, it's making sure that we help these organisations speed things up or keep things on time so it's that can never change that can never disappear now how do you do it depends on all those focus yeah points okay. that you touch on. and how do you you know i think one of the things as a leader is um you know you've got the business but you're always looking you know i sense in you you're a future looking leader you're across 
what's going on inside the society and what are the headwinds and tailwinds that you, you face mm -hmm. as an organization. What's the balance between new ideas and opportunistically trying a new technology, a new way of working, building a new go to my, uh, new management structure, <coughs> whatever those things are, they have a disruptive potential for the organization, but they also have an opportunity to accelerate it. Mm. How do you try and gauge where do we need to make changes? Where, wh what needs to happen next that's different to what's been happening in the past <coughs> to get us to where we want to go? So if, in my head, if I was to kind of take that and just go rephrase it, it's like, how do we weigh up the opportunity? Yep. Right? Like if, if this is going really well, all of a sudden, why do we, would we go here? Size of the price, right? To me, is like, are we better off shifting our focus here and being okay with the fact this is going to drop off? If not, don't do it. Yeah, okay. If yes, do it. And also, I think leadership, having, you know, having really good mentors throughout my career, it's also about the buy-in process. Are we all united on that front? Are we all wanting to do this? Well, that's where you yeah. know it's going to be a distraction. It can't be a captain's call. Right? It can't be like, we're doing this tomorrow because to me it makes sense because I read the latest article on AI. Yeah. Like, it's not about that anymore. It's about... Yeah. It's, It'll be a, yep. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, so th I think there's got to be those conversations held. And we're quite dynamic. So just obviously having been working with, having worked with Deep Space team for the last year, I know how they operate being a board member, now coming in yeah, okay. in the tent, so to speak. I kind of know the rhythm. I know how people chat and how people engage. So we can easily have these conversation and get into this mindset, okay, let's revisit this conversation next week. Let's sleep on it. Let's get some more data points, right? So again, there's got to be some sort of a pattern or it turns into this organized chaos, <laughs> which <laughs> I don't think it works for me. I don't think it works for too many people. But that doesn't scale. You can't scale it doesn't chaos. scale. So again, scale is all about having those milestones and having that repeatability. Because even in order to scale, at some point you're going to need funding. Yep. So having been an investor in the investor seed, having at Simpro, obviously, Sean and team did amazingly and I was part of those raises. You kind of know what they're looking for too. So yeah. I think piecing all of that together you kind of go, you have to know where you're heading and how you're going to get there. Team plays a huge part, like huge. And I think so does leadership. What, you know, I think about the current economic uncertainty, um, some of the challenges facing us globally, you know, the supply chain, what's going on geopolitically. Like mm. it's a pretty interesting sure. time. Sure. What do you think are the leadership capabilities that tech CEOs and founders, what's going to be, that's going to carry the good to great leaders in the next, just, let's just go 12 to 24 months. <clears throat> and I think this is as much about yeah. the next generation coming up. Yeah. They have a different skill set and perspective and worldview yeah. than we do. So what are those leadership traits you think are going to help Kiwi tech companies scale, grow, dominate? Another deep question. Geopolitically, obviously, we're in this really strange times. I feel for a lot of people that are going through some sort of, uh, you know, lots of chaos. So uh, coming back to your question about leadership, what will it take? There's, there's a lot of frontiers that we, you know, AI, there's a lot of talks about it's going to replace humans. I think for Don't me, say, yeah, <laughs> it will never have, I, I'm with you. I, I, I think a lot of it just boils down to connections. I think having really good mm. connections with your team being open, being vulnerable. So when I look at mentors and leaders I worked with, they know their limitation. They're very open to feedback. They're vulnerable. Nice. They also are very clear. They don't know anything. They don't know everything. Yeah, Not okay. anything, everything. Yeah, yeah. Right? And just being very open about that fact. So do I know what's going to happen in 24 months? No. Do I have any control over that? Most likely no. What are the things that I can control? What are the things my team can control? Mm. What can we collectively control? Putting your energy and focus on the things that you can control takes a lot of that away. For me, as, a, as an individual, I don't read up news. I made this conscious decision some years ago. I got rid of all the apps. I don't watch too much news. Uh, 
I'm very mindful of obviously what's happening in the space of tech. I know what our customers are doing. I'm very obsessed with their challenges and the problems they're having to overcome. So I naturally gravitate to that and reading up a lot about that and talking to those customers and just being fixated on how are we gonna get them to yeah. it, right? And then as opposed to just finding solutions to your own questions in this little isolated island, I'd rather just talk to customers. Yeah, okay. And be, again, go back to being obsessive with their journey. Yeah. Um, that usually filters out I, most of the concerns. I like that. I think vulnerability, honesty, transparency, these are, these are humanistic skills that um, no Gen AI will ever be able to replicate. I hope not, yeah. Well, I don't think so. But I think it leads me, you know, I think about what are the trends? So, you know, let's assume we're going to have a more stable 2025. What do you see as the sort of the, the technology trends that will be influencing New Zealand tech companies? And you can touch on AI and because obviously that's a big part of it, but there's way more than AI as we know that it's just a tool. Sure. But there are other trends that are happening. I'm interested to see, you know, especially I love the fact that you're not necessarily hanging on the news every day because it is yeah, pretty yeah, depressing. Yeah, yeah. So what else are you seeing? Well, what can we expect? I mean, look, interest rates and everyone's talking about that. <laughs> and that's, there are, there are smarter people. Have you got a prediction will, for us? <laughs> no, I don't. There are, you? Smart, there, are smarter, <laughs> there are smarter people than me who will solve that issue, right? So I think the, the, provided that all things are equal and we're heading in the right direction as far as the economy goes, the, the bigger trends that are happening is obviously you can't get past AI. Like, I, I have to be really honest and somewhat biased with what we're doing at this space. Now, AI, but it can't just be AI for the sake of AI. There's a lot of AI hype. It was no different with IoT back in the days. There was no different with BIM. There was no Big different data. with any technology, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. So finding good use cases mm. and helping human beings. So I think for me with, with data and AI, it's very much about co-pilot. Can it help me become a better Yep. efficient human being at work and in my professional career, absolutely awesome, go for it. Outside of that, it's very much about, you know, sustainability is a big thing, obviously ECG and all of that stuff is, I, you know, I, I take care of. Uh, Going to become more important, do you think? Is becoming more important? Because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of greenwashing mm, and sure, there's a lot of, sure. you know, lip service. We're seeing at a board level, more boards now are looking for ESG, um, measures when they look mm -hmm. at you know data center or purchasing technology or TCO that kind of thing mm -hmm. but do you think it's going to become more something we have more front and center again I like to think so okay will it will it actually happen I think time will tell the AI technology is putting a lot of pressure on the bandwidth of our natural resources yeah. so something will need to be done at some point in time now there's always this friction between commercialization versus what is good for for our community and society, but I th again, I'm hoping the right people will find the solution. Yeah, okay. But I think there will be deeper focus. There is insane number of data centers that are currently being built, right? Hospitals. Well, we've got a new one, Microsoft North thing built here. Is, I know, there's you know, just, like that, it just yeah. it's insane. And so that's, yeah. that's having an impact on the planet sure. because there's a lot of, you know, well, they're green, there's a lot more um, calling required. We're seeing now, was it the Microsoft and Redmond, the, um, yeah. The water consumption to keep their data centers yeah. cool because of yeah. the AI that they're yes. building is, yeah. yeah, 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 okay. So outside of that, the only last thing I was going to talk about is we're all dealing with app fatigue, right? There's too much tech, almost, right? How often do you go to a restaurant or gym? Everyone's got their headphones on. Everyone's got an app, right? Everyone's mm. got something. Will we sh see a shift from that? I'm not entirely sure. However, from a B2B perspective, there's just far too many point solutions, yeah, right? Okay. There's, there's so many disconnected solutions, which at one point served the means to whatever the problem was. Now, there's a lot of talks when you go on things like LinkedIn about go to market, tech stack, and it was a feature which can easily be rolled up. But even just from a construction perspective, looking back 15, 20 years ago, construction's always lagged in terms of technology iPhones and smartphones had a lot to do with, you know, the progress that construction sites are made. Yeah, okay. But 
there's still now lots of point solutions. So if I'm a field engineer, if I have to switch between various apps to try and get through my day, I don't know if I'm any more efficient. It's just given me lots of different ways to enter a data, right? Point. So I see this future, or near future, to answer your question, in the next year or two, consolidation. Yeah, okay. Which we're already starting to see a lot of. Integration. Integration, consolidation, consolidation yeah. aggregation, right? So it makes our lives actually simpler and efficient and easier. It is, it Otherwise, is. It's, it's, I mean, I'm sure you feel the same way, right? Well, it's about understanding the customer experience. And what, how does the customer live day to day? And how do we make that easier? And you're right, we are fatigued by the number of tech products and apps that we use and, the, and how we're bombarded with messages and new things that we can add. But there yeah. is only so much that as oh. humans we can absorb. Exactly. Um, just like different tact, what's your superpower? <laughs> I think I touched on it earlier, speed. Okay. So now again, it's somewhat contradicting to what I've been saying, but if you message me, if you want a decision, if you email me, if you slack, whatever, I've always been one of those people I'm going to try and get to it yeah. very quickly. I just want it off my desk. So for me, it's about uh, not being about perfect. Perfect is enemy of good. Getting to a decision, going back to very quickly in my head, yeah, okay. the, the focus and the vision, if it doesn't need it, I'd rather just go no. And not but get yet. it off your plate. Get it off my plate, but also get it off people's plate, the team's plate. Because otherwise, if you sit on it, they sit on it, yeah. and the inefficiencies creep in the business. Yeah, right. right. So if nice. I go, not a priority, let's move on. It could just simply be, I still use emails or texts that just say, okay, why? Yes, no. Like, that's, that's it. But right. get it off your plate. Remove it from your headspace re requirements exactly. to move on. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I like it. It's a good superpower, clearly. It's put you in good stead. Last question. Yeah, please. What are you reading? What are you reading? What are you listening to? What's sitting beside the bed? Uh, good question. I do listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of hip hop music, depending on the environment I'm in. Uh, the book that I've been reading, I'm not, I must admit, my, Lorraine will tell you this. I'm not a huge reader when it comes to books, but she did give me LeBron James, uh, yeah, thing, which okay. is quite cool. So. I, I've read up on him, I've obviously watched his journey firsthand, but just learning more about his, his early childhood and the, the experience he had and the, the, yep. the challenges he had to overcome. So I'm, I'm, leaning, okay. I'm, I'm leaning towards that at the moment, that's, that's quite a cool one. What about podcast? What's a podcast? What's your go-to podcast uh, if you're driving because you live out yeah. further up the shore? Mm. I don't know if I have one, it changes depending on which. So at the moment, having stepped into this role, I'm reading a lot about what's happening in construction yeah, tech. Yeah, right. Yep. right. So I've switched. Traditionally, obviously very biased towards go to market. So yes. anything towards go to market. Uh, keep a little bit eye on what's happening in the VC space. So yes. try and tie everything together, but anything that's tech oriented. Yeah. Um, more business focused as opposed to some of the other stuff is what I. And hip hop, what's your favorite hip hop? Ooh. Put it today, <laughs> today, today, just today. You know, uh, because like, that's like, what's your favorite song? Can I just song? give you can, instead of just uh, '90s and early 2000s? Okay, nice. right. I won't get yeah. too more. Okay. I won't get too controversial that's brilliant. Be on that. Yeah. Look, Ricky, I've really enjoyed the conversation you have had and will have, and are having an amazing career. Thank you so much for just taking some time to sway with with us and swaying with strangers. And uh, we, I know we'll be seeing you in your new role at Deep Space and all the best. Awesome. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Yeah, Pleasure. no problem. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. Awesome.